that by a hundred percent or or a thousand percent. You know, you can understand that. Our, our legislators, uh, was mentioned earlier that, you know, kind of our, our highway plan is, you know, it's, it's legislature driven. They can understand numbers like that, that my constituents, you know, would have access to X number of more jobs, you know, that, that benefits my, 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 my constituents. So that's what we're, we're getting at. Um, there's a, we do slightly weight it a little bit. Uh, if you are from a distressed, economically distressed uh, area, um, the, the thought is that we might give it just a very, very slight uh, little extra boost. Um, you know, that's that's how the regional has always and the district wide has always been set up. The statewide was about it favored the I'll, I don't want to say urban areas, but it favored the, the areas that that already had um, a, a, a lot of jobs. Um, uh, was producing, you know, a, a lot of our, our our GDP things of that nature, and once you got to the regional aspect, um, it was trying to figure out how to best serve those areas that that didn't have, you know, a, a, a lot of uh, uh, job opportunities, and so we're continuing that tradition with this, and uh, that's what we're saying. Uh, we talk about the the people living in poverty. That's that's uh, what that is. Uh, if you live in a an economically distressed uh, situation. Okay, it's been recorded. Thanks. Um, next up is the resiliency. I don't, I don't know how I am on time, Jacob. If you got the little cards or what? Five minutes. Okay, I can do that. Maybe. Uh, the resilience. See, um, we talked about the criticality. That's kind of what we did last time. Uh, one new aspect of it: uh, the top, the the between us, uh, cent, uh, 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 centri centri centrality. I told you, I can't, I can't, I can't talk the, the, the cleanest, especially those big words. Uh, that's what we did last time, but we, we, we've introduced and adding another aspect to it that we're calling our, uh, uh, the, the kind of the, the detour score, I guess. Um, and, and it basically what that gets into is there's a, there's a lot of times, um, and, and probably the one that, that kicked this off was, uh, you know, I'm from District 10, and uh, so you might be aware that we had, had to shut the Mountain Parkway down for about four months. And, you know, the, the Mountain Parkway is the only four lane, you know, it's it's the route into the almost the entirety uh, of Eastern Kentucky. And so it's very, very important. Um, the problem is we're never going to be rebuilding. We're, we're, we're not going to six lane or eight lane the Mountain Parkway. You know, it's not interstate, 10,000 uh, 10, cars a day, things of that nature. However, if things do happen, um, this it, it ended up being kind of a, a, a cavern underneath it had collapsed and created a hole. You know, we had to dig down uh, somewhere like 70 feet deep and open up, you know, a large hole. So we shut the parkway down for about four months. So what do you do? We ended up having to use two different routes and one way those routes in order to, to send traffic. That's probably not a good thing. And the reason is, is because perhaps the shoulders weren't exactly wide enough. The lanes, if if on either one of those routes the lanes had been just one foot wider, we could have ran the traffic, you know, on one on one roadway. And so that's what this is getting into. What we're measuring is okay. So what's the 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 top couple of primary detour routes that would serve if this shut down the Brent Spence Bridge? It shuts down. What's the primary detour route? So it's it's trying to to look at some uh, the what what would we would refer to as redundancy. Um, you know, it's a pretty important concept, and it's going to help our system uh, to to look at, at that. Uh, uh, District Ten is actually doing uh, one of those routes that we talked about that that made it into the highway plan. Uh, that was part of the arguments. Like you know, here's you know, let's introduce a little bit of redundancy. Um, small project. We're just going to widen the shoulders by or well. I think Darren's on here. Uh, Darren could talk to it if you ever talked to him. I think he's project manager, maybe, or no, um, Ethan is. But anyway, it's uh, just going to perhaps widen some shoulders a, a little bit. Not a big expense, a couple million dollars for you know fifteen miles type situation, and so that that's uh, that's a big win. So that's what's going on here. That's what we're trying to measure. Oh boy! Next up, bike and pads. Um, this was a fight. Um, Man, those bike ped people, they're, 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 they're pretty violent. They can almost get violent. I thought we was going to come to blows at, at one point of 
how we're going to score this and how many points it's worth and things of that nature. Yeah, I'm telling you. you well, I mean, I guess so. And it didn't help. I mean, kind of like I said, uh, Dr. Smadiatis, he's not on here. No, like I think he was in Greece and heck, you could, uh, I don't think he needed the computer to, to yell. No, it's 10 points, damn it, it's 10 points. Hey, that's not, it's, it, was, uh, it, was, it was great and fun. This is our first stab. Um, you can see we've got a couple of different categories, bicycle, pedestrian, and it's kind of a half and half. Uh, this is worth a, a total of five points. You know, so we're saying it's 5% of the, the stiff score uh, type situation. Um, so it's it's just dipping, our, you know, we're, we're, we're dipping our toes in. We're, we're starting this off. Uh, Keith, as we've already talked about, we're going to um, – to, to try to make improvements to this uh, over the next two years. Uh, but this does, like I said, it does get us started. It, it gets us down that direction. And shift, and one of the big things is a continual improvement. And so that's what we plan on doing. Um, yeah, there's no point in going down this. Um, you can see uh, back and forth. I'm sure the presentation, we can probably can send this out and and uh, you'll, you'll see what's going on with this. Um, this is some of the stuff. This is new information for, for well, I'll talk about it in just a second. Uh, next big thing, sponsorships, boost. Sponsorships are staying the same. There was some discussion about reduction, maybe even one person, uh, let's add to it. But but we decided that we're going to keep those the same. If you recall, we did reduce these last time. Um, um, but we're, we're going to keep them the, the same this time. Doesn't mean you have to use them all. Uh, uh, several, I know highway districts didn't last time. I even think there was one or two ads who didn't use all of theirs. So th there, there's no harm in that. Boost are being reduced though. Um, it's basically being 10% uh, reduction from last time and I rounded down. That was my concession. I think in the spill yesterday, I agreed to just 10%. No, not I. We, but I, I shut up. How's that? And if you've ever been in a conversation with me to get me to shut up is worth a whole lot. Uh, so it's a 10% reduction from what you did last time, uh, kind of rounded down. You can see the numbers there. I will be sending this stuff out after this meeting. Uh, no question about it. Uh, shouldn't be a big, big surprise to anybody. Um, you still got plenty. And what I can tell you is uh, uh, with the, the new categories, um, you know, the boost points are going to, to have a lot more value this round than what they did last round. Um, one thing that, that uh, so a couple of things that I don't have in here is the boost are being reduced. If you're uh, last time, they were worth 15 points each. They're only going to be worth 10 points now. So we added two new components. We got to get points from somewhere. And how the structure is this time with these being such a, a, a it's a, an increase kind of in their overall value. Um, it was okay to, you know, uh, I think the, we ended up consenting that uh, taking five points from the the, the two boost um, what was an acceptable you know uh, situation. Uh, schedule, yes, there is a schedule. Uh, quick question: uh, Casey is on here. For those that don't know, I was in a fender bender yesterday morning on the way to work, and uh, they're out there in Lexington on the interstate. And so I called District 7, hey, Casey, can you come and pick me up, you know, uh, take me to the office so I can, you know, get some work done, things of that nature. No problem. Casey did it. Good, good sport. Rose up, you know, my car's up and underneath a tractor and trailer, this, that, and other. Casey jumps out and the first thing says, so, Jason, uh, uh, have you got the schedule yet, uh, you know, for shift? I really did. <laughs> so, uh, what and how you doing? You know, so I've got some little cuts on my head, things of that nature. It's have you got the shift schedule yet? Yes, the shift schedule is here. <laughs> That's right. Uh, uh, I will send this out as well. Um, that is pretty much it. That's kind of the updates uh, as a whole. I said I'll send out a little bit of packet showing kind of the the new points, things of that nature. Um, the only other thing um, that's not on here, the chaffs, and I know that the ads had kind of a chaff training yesterday. I hope that went well. Randall, everything uh, goes smooth, good shape. Okay. 
there is kind of a new page on chaff that probably the district offices will fill out. I don't think we limit it to them though. And it, it involves the, if I can go backwards, how do I go backwards? Previous, previous, previous. It involves this data right here. There's kind of a new page and uh, you're gonna, you got to go through and uh, just a big check boxes. Will your project do this? You know, is it going to, you know, is it going to have a separated, you know, bike lane? Um, is it going to have wayfinding type signs? And so that that's new. And there's a lot of those check boxes. Very, very important that things like that are marked. If they're not marked and you don't mark them, then guess what? No project defined, no project defined, you get zero. So um, th that is something new. Um, I, I think the ads and MPOs can probably do it as well. Um, what I caution is make sure that the districts are aware of it um, if an ad or MPO does do it, because when you do add an extra five feet for a bike lane or a shared use path versus a sidewalk, there is an increase in cost, and the project needs to reflect that, that, that increase in cost as well. Uh-oh. What's wrong? Please say I didn't do it. Okay. I can't spell. I actually think I got this from Dr. Stamatiotis. So if the professor at UK says it's spelled properly, then it's spelled properly. That's true. He's Greece. Oh, Greek. Oh, okay. Well, anyway, um, so that's about it. Uh, thanks for bearing with me. Uh, anybody got any questions, comments, thoughts, anything like that? See, I saw Shane had his hand raised in the virtual world. All right. Shane, if you're out there, you can talk, I guess. Put your hand down. I was going to uh, follow up on what Jason had to say about Casey. You ought to work for the guy, man. He's all business all the time, okay? So don't think that you were, uh, you know, special by him not asking how you were doing, okay? So he's a tyrant. Oh, God. oh no. <laughs> I see that now. Like I mean, I, I had, you know, rags, I, you know, bloody rags. My hands were covered, but, and, and sure enough, I mean, seriously, that's the first thing he says when he jumps out. Uh, what are the weights of the seven? See, look here. What are the weights? <laughs> oh, going right back Ask to this. Uh, I'll send that Jason. out uh, in a little <laughs> chart uh, because I'm, I'm not going to quote them top of my head because somebody's going to say, no, that's wrong. It's this. Um, I do have that. Uh, and I will send that out with everything else. I said, we had to come up with some points from somewhere. So there was a, a, the, there are a few changes. Uh, you'll see. Like I said, the biggest change was the boost from 15 down to 10. Um, and then we took five, we redistributed five points from maybe congestion or something like that um, is what it was. But I'll send that out, Casey. Don't you dare worry, sir. I see anybody else in the audience uh, in the house? No, no question, no hands. All right, Jason. Yeah, good job. Hand claps, good job. All right, you've heard me for a long time. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Good updates. Good updates on shift. I know it's changing and it's good to have you in the lead there. You probably understand it better than anybody, right? <laughs> Post to, uh, I don't know if I go that far. Okay, let's see. Uh, next speaker. We've got a break coming at about 10 30, uh, Susan. So uh, it's about, we're maybe five minutes or so over. You should have enough time. We'll see how it goes. Uh, Susan Neumeyer uh, is KYTC Archaeologist Coordinator, Division of Environmental Analysis. And uh, we have this committee, you know, STP committee kind of talks about ideas and things. I think uh, Terry sticking out of over. So she saw your, she saw it on the news, so I think an Ashto newsletter or something. She saw this website, archaeology website. She's like, well, I wonder who can do that. So we reached out to you guys and they nominated you to talk about it. <laughs> so good luck. Yeah, go ahead. Do you have my presentation? Yeah, let me pull it up here. Start sharing it. This is you right here. Let me share the screen. This is it. We're gonna, yeah. And beginning. There you go. And you can use that or the buttons, whatever you want okay, to do. Okay, thanks. Hi. Um, thanks for inviting me to be here today. I'm one of the other archaeologists in the Division of Environmental Analysis, one of the ones that's not Carl Shields. Um, you may have been fortunate enough to see or hear Carl give presentations. He's a very dynamic speaker, and he really enjoys what he does. Um, 
I enjoy what I do too. I'm not quite as flamboyant as Carl, but you know, when I start talking and I do this, my husband calls it flapping. If I start flapping, um, you know, I'm excited about something. So I'm here today to talk about Discover Kentucky Archaeology. This is a web portal that went live last July. And the idea was, well, have you ever looked around your neighborhood and wondered who lived there before you, what their lives may have been like? Maybe you've driven through a part of the Commonwealth you're not familiar with and wanted to know about the history of the area. Well, this web portal is designed to help you learn about those and answer those types of questions. Right now we have site descriptions from 64 counties and the portal's designed to be a living flexible document. So as we get more information about sites and more documentation, we'll fold those in and expand till hopefully we have at least one site representing all 120 counties. Now the web portal is an example of alternative mitigation. And what that means is Brace yourselves. As the pro product of Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act, I know a lot of people think those are bad words, um, but Section 106 drives what we do in cultural resources for the most part. And it requires that when there's federal money or federal permitting or licensing involved in a project, we have to consider the effects of that project on cultural resources, both above ground, like buildings or monuments, and below ground, archaeological resources. It doesn't say we have to do something specific if there are resources there, but just that we consider the effects to them. And in archaeology, we consider the effects in three different ways. We have phase one intensive survey. We, you want, we want to know if there's a site present or not. Phase two testing means we found sites. Now we want to see if they're eligible for the National Register of Historic Places. And phase three is yes, we found an eligible or a listed site. It's going to be adversely affected. And we're going to do data recovery or mitigation most often. And that's a major excavation. We're going to do that to mitigate the effect, the adverse effects on that resource. Well, sometimes for a variety of reasons, we can't excavate a site. Maybe the water table's too high, and so it would be a dangerous situation, or the site has been disturbed, and so we're not going to get any information out of it, but we still had an effect on that resource. So we have to come up with alternative mitigation, some way to mitigate those adverse effects on historic resources. And the government agency that drives all this is the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation. And they really like creative ideas for alternative mitigation. And over the past several years, the Transportation Cabinet has started establishing a reputation for being creative when we have to do alternative mitigation. There we go. Um, this is the web portal homepage, the splash page. If you have devices, feel free to check it out. Or you can just search for Discover Kentucky Archaeology, and that will take you right to the site. This is the splash page where you'll find yourself when you first approach the site. And what it is is, um, 64 site descriptions organized by county, organized alphabetically. You can also search by site type or by time period or by county. Here's the main page when you, let me go back one. Up at the top, you'll see home, find a site about and contact. If you go to about, that will give you more information on those three levels of um, archeological investigation I mentioned. But if you go to find a site, you'll end up on this page. And here's an alphabetical listing of the sites, uh, or you can search, maybe you're interested in the early woodland period, 1000 to 200 BC. You can search by early woodland and see all the sites we have 
um, represented, representing the early woodland period. Or maybe you want to see information about caves. You can certainly do that. And again, by county. So I went down that alphabetical list and I selected cold oak, a late archaic 5,000 to 3,000 years ago rock shelter in Lee County. So I click on the photo and it takes me to the cold oak site description. And up at the top here, every site description is formatted the same way. So you have a, um, a familiar layout. So you've got some basic information like the site number. In this case, it's 15 LE 50. 15 refers to Kentucky. LE refers to the county, the Lee County, and it's the 50th site recorded in the county. Then you get information about what type of site it is, the rock shelter, the author of the information you have. And then in the bulk of the site description, you have a summary, findings, and the best part, what's cool? What about this site is interesting or unique or really got archeologists excited? Well, in Cold Oak's case, they found evidence of plant domestication. Plants were domesticated on the way to becoming, on the people's way to becoming farmers. And that only happened independently in a handful of places around the entire world. And one of them was in Red River Gorge. And we know that through the investigations at Cold Oak and some of the other shelters in that area. <laughs> Excuse me, my mouth is getting dry. Oh, great, thank you. <laughs> I'll have a snack and be right back with you. Um, so we look at pre-contact or prehistoric sites, and we also have information about historic sites. <coughs> Excuse me. I pulled Ashland, the Henry Clay Estate. This is actually a site you can go visit. Cold Oak Shelter, we don't publish the specific site location because we don't want to help anybody go loot or damage the, the properties. But Ashland is a publicly accessible site. And you'll see in these two examples, we have photographs of archeology span happening, some artifacts, and some, in this case, some archival information. Again, you have the summary, the results, or the findings, and what's cool. For Ashland, one of the things that was cool is that they excavated a privy and they found all kinds of cookware and servingware. And it let them know, gave the archeologist an idea of what kind of foods were being served, where the materials were coming from. They found locally made pottery, the types of dishware that, was, that were being used. Um, they, were, they had Chinese and European porcelain. They had the locally made pottery. So they were bringing in serving ware from all kinds of places. Then moving down the page below what's cool, you have related materials. And I didn't point it out for cold oak. That box was blank because there aren't any digital um, sites about cold oak. But here for Ashland, we have Ashland's webpage. We have the Kentucky Archaeological Survey site about Ashland and about their excavations there. And then a movie, Hidden, Hidden, sorry, Historic Archaeology Beneath Kentucky's Fields and Streams. And then you can keep the search alive. You can keep searching. If, you're, if you like antebellum plantations, you can search by the antebellum time period or you can search by plantations. Under antebellum, it comes up with a pottery, a farmstead, and a church. So you can get an idea of a variety of different site types that we've looked at. Or by category, these are all plantations, Forest Home, Pepper House, Riverside, the Farnsley Mormon Landing in Louisville, which is also publicly available, accessible. Um, our usage statistics. As I said, we have site descriptions for 64 counties. Can't wait till we get all 120 counties represented. The portal launched on July 17th of last year. 
Since then, we've had almost 29,000 views and 22,000 unique views. And I've been told this is a fantastic number. The average time on the spent on the page is a minute 20. Seems kind of light to me, but the computer folks told me that's good. In addition to the web portal, we've recently been involved in a number of other forms of alternative mitigation. For example, for Louisville Bridges, we came up with this brochure and it talks about section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act, why it was important in the Louisville Bridges project and what it means. It's a two-sided brochure, four panels, and it's aimed at the general public. And I have a bunch with me. If you would like some, if you would like to take some back to your offices, please, they're not doing us any good sitting in a cabinet in my office. We also have, uh, as a form of alternative mitigation, the Falls of the Ohio River book. This came out in 2021. It was published by the University Press of Florida. Um, and well, several years ago, we had a special session associated with the Kentucky Heritage Council Annual Archaeological Conference. And in that session, we invited people with expertise in archaeology of the Falls region to come and we had this great roundtable discussion for a day. Discussion, argument, potato, potato. Um, and this book is the result of that. And it brings together our current state of knowledge of archaeology in the Falls region. We gave copies to every university in the state that has an anthropology department. We sent that to their libraries. We shared the book with NDOT, with the K Kentucky and Indiana State Historic Preservation Offices, with the Filson Library in Louisville, with Kentucky Office of State Archaeology, and with Falls of the Ohio State Park. When we do alternative mitigation, we have a requirement and an obligation to do public education. So we're not keeping all this information secret. We wanna share it far and wide. And so by distributing this book, that's one way we're meeting that obligation. The web portal is another example of how we're meeting our public education commitment. Another example of alternative mitigation is we contributed money to Living Archaeology Weekend. This is the largest archaeological public education event in the state. It's held the third weekend in September every year, exclusive of COVID. And it's held at the Lady Environmental and Cultural Learning Center in Red River Gorge. It's held outside. There's a pre-contact area and a post-contact or historic area. And this is a completely free event. On, it's on Friday and Saturday of that third weekend. And on Fridays, fifth grade students from all over come and participate because it's a very interactive event. And it, we target fifth grade students because that's when they do their Native American heritage studies. And there are teacher packets, and lesson plans that have been developed to go along with Living Archaeology Weekend, or for short, I call it law. This is a look at the general grounds. Um, we have these canopies that are set up, and there are individual demonstrators and volunteers who, who, sorry, demonstrate their particular crafts. So we have flint nappers making stone projectile points. There are pottery makers, there are basket weavers. There's one guy who cooks food in an earth oven. Because um, we find remains of earth ovens archeologically on sites. Every year, we invite representatives from this, one of the six federally recognized Indian tribes that has an interest in the area. That's three tribes of Shawnee Indians and three tribes of Cherokee Indians. And in this slide, you can see some native dancers in their traditional regalia performing a dance. Um, one year we had some Cherokee Indians present and they led the kids in a stickball, a traditional 
stickball game. I wasn't there that day, but apparently a lot of fun was had by everybody. And I mentioned it's interactive. Uh, this is a man trying his hand at an atlatl, which is a spear throwing device. If I just take a spear and try and chuck it, I'm not going to get very much distance or very much force. But this is a long piece of wood or bone, and it has a hook at the end. And I can stick my spear point in that hook. Now it's basically lengthened my arm, and I get greater force and greater distance. So when you're hunting large animals, that's to your benefit. When the weather's good, on Fridays at Living Archaeology Weekend, we can have up to 1,500 school kids come. And on Saturday, 1,000 to 1,200 members of the public come. And I've seen people there using canes and walkers and wheelchairs. Um, it's completely accessible to everybody. And this Living Archaeology Weekend has won awards internationally for what it does. And so our, our alternative mitigation was to provide funding and support the event at a time when it looked like it was done for and was going to die out. So we've helped to keep this event going. So I want to thank you again for having me here. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to try and answer them. And again, I have that brochure available. You're going to a break, so come talk to me. Yeah, cool. A fantastic job, Susan. That's a great presentation. Give some applause for Susan. And let's see, I'm looking for the chat. Uh, I think somebody asked for the website and then somebody else posted, yeah, okay. The link for the archeological portal and uh, Natalie put it on there. Yeah, if we go back to the beginning. Okay. And uh, you mentioned Red River Gorge there. And Steve's going to talk after the break about like our studies and stuff. Don't we have one in Red River Gorge, Steve? Yeah, okay. So have you guys been out there on the road? Yeah. Have you guys been out there, I guess, already for like a Red River Gorge type thing? Uh, we're just doing, we're just not kicking off a study. Uh, we'll talk about after break, but I was curious if you guys have been out there recent or not. Yeah, we've done various surveys in the gorge, mm -hmm. um, mostly within our presumed right of way. Uh, it's Daniel Boone National Forest land. So that gets a little complicated when you have different federal agencies. I got you. Yeah, it'll be interesting. It'll be interesting to see what that happens with study. So uh, uh, you go ahead. Sorry, in a previous job about 20 years ago, I nominated and got listed the, the entire Red River Gorge area, plus some, to the National Register of Historic Places. So the entire area is a listed historic resource. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, cool. It's fascinating. And not a tunnel and all that kind of stuff over there. Yeah. Uh, let's see anybody in the audience, nobody in the house. Yeah. Everybody's looking forward to the break, I guess, Susan. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, thanks for your time and the materials and all that kind of stuff and help yourself to the treats there if you want to take them with you. Uh, and Susan, yeah, I guess you'll stick around for a few minutes. I guess if they want a brochure or something. Sure. Yeah, I'll be yeah. here for a little bit. Okay, and then we'll come back. Uh, we'll go ahead and take a break then, 1030, and come back in about 15 minutes to listen to Mr. Steve DeWitt at 1045. So I will now mute this. And you guys feel free online. Put some stuff in the chat box if you want. We'll field it when we get back. Thanks. Thanks, Jason. Be the man.
All right, guys, thanks for your uh, time and attention. Coming back from break, I've got 1045. Looking forward to Mr. Steve DeWitt's over there talking to some planners. That's good, good planning. And uh, we'll kick it back off here whenever Steve gets up here with uh, the afternoon piece of our January STP meeting. So uh, let me see, let me read. Let me read Steve's short bio here. Uh, Mr. Steve DeWitt is the KYTC Strategic Planning Branch Manager. Mr. Steve DeWitt is a 2013 graduate. You really don't need to. 2013 graduate Purdue. And uh, let's see, he's been at the cabinet since 2018. He's a newly minted KYTC Strategic Planning Branch Manager. <laughs> it's about three times the same thing. Yeah, go ahead, Steve. Uh, All right, can everybody hear me okay? Unfortunately. Okay, uh, like Jacob said, I'm Steve DeWitt. I'm the branch manager of strategic planning, and uh, I'm here to talk about the five W's of planning study. Now, who, who here has ever heard of the phrase, the five W's? Anybody at all? Yeah, Mr. Lovett and Mr. Sawala. Can anyone tell me what the first W is? Who? Excellent. This doesn't work. I probably did break it. Who? Okay. Yep. All right. Who? Who are you? Who is the strategic planning branch? Now, who up here recognizes this band? Okay. It is the who. So, and of their album, Who Are You? Their eighth studio album. This next part is going to require a slight working knowledge of the who to understand. So who, who are we here in, in strategic planning, doing planning studies? First, we have Mr. Dave Heil. Uh, newly minted permanent employee. Um, I had to steal this picture from his Facebook. Um, Dave over Dave oversees planning in D four, eight, and twelve. Now, you know Dave. Dave is a uh, kind of a, a already becoming a stalwart of our of our planning study operation, um, and kind of of this group, I see Dave as Pete Townsend up there. So. All right, Mr. Jared Jeffers. Uh, Jared is a new EIT uh, who came to work with us over the summer. Jared, ha Jared has districts three and 10. Now, I think there's really only one place that Jared can go. Right there. Uh, Jared's got Roger Daughtry. Third, Mr. Brent Swager. Uh, Brent uh, came over to us from Highway Design. Uh, he's got districts two, seven, and 11. Uh, Brent takes the place of John Entwistle with the nice jean jacket right there. Now, for me, my name, Steve DeWitt, I've kept districts one and five since I uh, became the branch manager, and I'm going to take the place of Keith Moon. Now, I don't plan on dying three weeks after showing this picture and crashing a car into a, a Holiday Inn uh, swimming pool like Mr. Moon did. Now, the mathematicians among you might have noticed that there's only 10 districts spoken for so far, but of course the cabinet has 12. So who, who's got the other two districts? I ask the room. Mr. Blackburn, who has successfully removed his image from the internet and not allowed me to find anything from it, except for one screen grab of a shift video. <laughs> And there he is. Now, the eagle-eyed among you, not just the mathematicians, might have noticed that there are only four members of the Who in the in the album cover I showed you. So, where does that put Mr. Blackburn? Hmm, where could where could he be? Where could he go? Ah, uh, yes, right in between the keep clear sign. Keep away from Mr. Blackburn. <laughs> Danger. All right, all kidding aside, um, let's talk about what uh, what are the planning studies that we're working on. Uh, there's a lot of them, and I'll get to talking about that here in a little bit, but we have installed this giant whiteboard up in on the fourth floor where planning now resides to kind of keep track of all the planning studies that we have going on. Now, you might be able to tell this is a big whiteboard. 
Uh, there's lots of studies going on, and there's even some over here on this side that we're waiting to close out. There's lots of things going on in planning that I wanted to talk with you about, and I'm going to try and hit the highlights of those uh, in this session. As Jason mentioned early on, we had uh, 26 new studies that showed up in the biennium of the enacted highway plan. We had been used to seeing maybe four or five, maybe six on a, on a busy year. Uh, so 26 is a couple more, just a couple, you know, that's a joke. So we, we decided we're going to do 14 of those through our statewide planning contract, advertise another 13 of them. And we also have our ongoing SPR funded studies. Now, this is a pot of money that the cabinet can use to take a look at um, at needs that aren't identified in the highway plan that maybe the districts have identified that they don't they have an area that is not a project yet, but they want to see go what's going on. So we still have 11 of those to do in this uh, in this biennium. And we decided we're going to do eight of those through statewide planning and another three that we're going to um, advertise. Yo. Sure. <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a that's a good point. I had a. Uh, I guess maybe my spreadsheet must be wrong. <laughs> I just grabbed this off a spreadsheet. Didn't even think about it. You know how I am in spreadsheets. So Excel has let me down. Now, what goes on in a planning study? Now, I don't expect you to be able to read this, but I wanted to highlight, just in case anyone is new and hadn't really under, been a part of a planning study process, kind of what's going on. And in big, big terms, it's we're identifying data um, at, at, at a, for a transportation facility or in a small urban area. And we use that data to identify transportation needs and look at potential improvement concepts that would address those needs. As those develop through the process, we come up with a draft purpose and need that might be able to follow that particular project all the way into preliminary engineering. We work with uh, you, like stakeholder involvement is, is very heavy. Sometimes on larger projects or projects that are funded, we uh, initiate the public involvement um, process going out to the public, possibly getting their, their feedback on potential issues and also getting their initial feedback on any potential improvement concepts. It's always a balance because you don't want to rile people up for something that doesn't have any funding, but you also want to get input from them on what's important to them and what are some things to avoid. Okay, so back to the number of planning studies we have got, got going on. Jared, uh, you know, our, our Roger Daltrey in the office uh, has a great, uh, great spreadsheet that mirrors what's on the, uh, on our giant whiteboard. And just wanted to, to show here kind of the where, where we have things going on. Um, you can see statewide and every district has got something not going on, except for district two, but that's not district two's fault. That's Bucky's fault. That's an inside joke. Um, and then, so let's talk about the when. When are we kind of doing these studies and how is that process going? Some of these larger studies, the ones I mentioned that were in the highway plan that needed to be advertised are going through the process right now. One of those uh, I was just talking to Mr. Hall about, 5-80,000 is the uh, Eastwood Fisherville connector to I-64 um, out there in Jefferson County, a long desired project by local officials in that area. Uh, QK4 was selected for that project just before Christmas. A really exciting one we have got going on, uh, just about to spin up, is this 5-577. Uh, it's a feasibility study for uh, connected autonomous vehicle lanes on I-64 between Louisville and Lexington. Now, that's a pretty broad scope. Uh, I-64 has a lot of different typical sections in this area. There's just a lot of things going on. And we don't really know what the CAV space is going to look like kind of in, into the future. And so this is kind of going to get that corridor ready to accept whatever uh, CAV deployments might be in the on the horizon. That one is a very complicated project. So we are doing interviews this week as part of the consultant selection process to kind of get a feel for some of these experts that might not necessarily be, reside in Kentucky. Uh, a couple other interesting uh, interesting studies in this latest bulletin, a study on US-25 uh, in Laurel County, uh, looking at US-25 north of the Hal Rogers. In the January bulletin, another exciting study, uh, 7-453, which is the next step of the Imagine Nicholasville Road study, kind of looking at the feasibility of 
bus rapid transit uh, and other types of solutions on Nicholasville Road between like from basically south of Man of War into downtown. Again, that's going to be a pretty complicated one. So we're going to do consultant interviews for that project. Uh, Brent Swager is the project, project manager from central office and Casey Smith is uh, the project manager from the district. Um, and then also later in the spring, we want to do a, a, a Kentucky 15 hazard to Whitesburg um, study, but we have not scheduled when that one is going to go out on the street. Now, some more kind of where's, where have we done studies recently? And this is just a, a, a brief spattering of screenshots that I, uh, that I grabbed. We did a, a study in East Lebanon uh, to look at kind of completing that bypass. Uh, a study on Kentucky 90 in Pulaski. We're about to wrap up a Kentucky 90 study in Wayne County, US 127, Russell County, uh, downtown Crestwood. We keep getting uh, semis hit by trains uh, at that location. So we did a study there. There's just a, a lot going on. And I could do a whole presentation on each of these. They are all interesting and varied, which kind of makes this job kind of exciting. As you can see, it's not every day you get you have to deal with, okay, we had a truck uh, delivering food to the women's prison, and it's now all over the tracks and all over our road. What are we going to do about it? That study was fun. Some things that are almost done. Mr. Frazier keeps telling me to, to review the uh, Northern Kentucky Active Traffic Demand Management Study. Uh, I'm a little bit behind on it, and I apologize. You can see this draft, October. It is January, and I have not reviewed it yet. <laughs> Um, we've also been looking at uh, this uh, this one over here on the right, the, this the one that says build concept studied studied for the people online. This is adjacent to the uh, new Ford SK uh, Blue Oval battery plant uh, in Glendale. And when you take a city that kind of had 200 people in it before and you drop 5,000 new employees in a giant uh, a set of manufacturing plants on top of it, it's going to change the transportation character of that region. And so this is kind of something to, this is a study looking holistically at that area for transportation improvements. It wouldn't be one of my presentations without talking about TISMO, uh, much to the chagrin of Mr. Blackburn and, uh, well, Mr. Andre Johannes hates TISMO, um, for anybody that knows him. But uh, we're in the process of wrapping up our TISMO program plan. Now, this is an effort to kind of guide the strategic uh, and business cases for TISMO, which for anyone that doesn't know is kind of an umbrella term that encompasses anything technological you could do to the roadway uh, to kind of improve its efficiency without necessarily widening it. So this could be anything from improved incident response to, to clear the roadway faster, things like ramp metering to stabilize the flow of an interstate. Or the things uh, that kind of tell you, hey, there's an incident on the on the uh, interstate, don't get on, you know, if you've ever seen those flashing lights. Um, exciting news that Zach Nyhoff uh, now works directly for Mr. Sawala as our TISMO coordinator. What's his title? Is that close enough? more aware of things that are going on now and now this is more exciting stuff who has ever been to a bucky's okay if you haven't you need to go it is an experience and it's amazing the cleanest bathrooms i've ever seen um and also just a wall of jerky a wall of icy is it's great they're building we they built one in richmond they're building one in smith's grove in district three right off the interstate so we're trying to do a study there there's there's more things going on right there than there were in Richmond, uh, and you're a little bit more constrained. And so we're going to have to be more creative to accommodate all that extra traffic in the future. We're also looking at a couple cave or a couple ferries. Um, the Turkey Neck Bend Bridge, uh, the Turkey Neck Bend Ferry is unique among all of Kentucky's ferries in that it is 100% KYTC fund and operated 24-7. Um, and approximately, what, 200 people use it a day, if that. Um, and so we're looking at if we can cross the Green River uh, more economically than funding a 24-7 ferry. Um, and I won't even mention Cave and Rock. It's caused enough headache. We've been looking at, uh, you know, what happens if you, Jason talked about criticality. What happens if the Clays Ferry Bridge, I-75 crossing the Kentucky River, shuts down? Bad news, right? There's nowhere to cross the river. Um, and so we're looking at 
the the routes that would potentially be used all the way down 75 or over on 64 what those routes would need to routes that connect those two interstates would need to what would need to happen kind of an emergency operations plan to uh to put into effect with signal timing potential bridge clearance issues what would need to be done on those detour routes to you can't really accommodate that much traffic but not make it completely miserable if that bridge is ever shut down for a long period of time uh the red river gorge transportation study we mentioned it earlier um that's kind of looking at the gorge area there's some culverts that are in need of that are in kind of rough shape um there's the nata tunnels operational issues and there's some potential park and ride kind of micro mini transits uh things that we could do in that area to improve improve the traffic flow there's uh what's the word for it surplus right of way that could potentially be used as a park and ride location that, that a bus could come pick you up and take you to different uh stops along the gorge just seeing if we can do things like that to improve the operation of the of the system inside the gorge a very exciting uh, planning environmental linkage study. Has anybody heard of a, a PEL, a planning environmental linkage? Mr. Fraser, good, good. Okay, well, I hope you guys do. You work for me. Um, this is a, a study that was added by the legislature to take a look at if there are other places to cross the Ohio River other than our US-51 bridge project that already has assigned uh, CE3. Uh, and so this is looking at a route that potentially goes through about eight miles of the Ballard WMA and crosses the river in a new location north of Cairo. This is a very in-depth st study to take a look at the environmental issues that something like that might might uh, might cause. And we're doing it as a planning environmental linkage to really nail down those uh, those impacts. Uh, I'm almost done, I promise. Uh, just want to keep going. Kentucky 3 in Floyd County, a nice District 12 study. It's Kentucky 3 in this section. It's very congested, and it's the only piece of a uh, four-lane corridor that does not exist between US 23 and Inez. Uh, we we're doing a small urban area study in Murray, um, which is, has a really heavy complete streets and bike ped component, working with the university and with the city to improve the connections that exist in that town um, to help uh both the university uh users and the the traveling public at large finally uh we're doing a, a fun programming study on kentucky 44 in bullock county very congested corridor that has had um a multitude of kind of plans and and designs done over the years some have different cross sections so we were looking at sort of, sort of putting those into a list that we could then give to the legislature and say here we really think this is the order and what should be done on this corridor um so please listen to us now let's talk about why you know who what when where why we're now at the why the important thing that we always want to consider is what we are doing this work for and ultimately that comes down to we want the people and goods that are using our transportation system the people taking the goods different places it's all about people we want them to get their destination safely and efficiently as possible every trip every time and we start that process in planning where the blank canvas we can see what we can do to the system to make those improvements the other thing that we kind of want to do is i've always made it my kind of goal to make the planning study process useful to our clients which are usually the districts uh, our other planning partners and the public at large i do not want our studies to sit on a shelf somewhere and never be used this is our planning library up on the fourth floor you can see lots of stuff in there <laughs> some of that stuff has never been has never been used whatsoever I want our products to get put into CHAP and PDP, go through the shift process, those studies to be used when professional services is advertising for consultants. This particular month had uh, three planning or design projects that came from planning uh, advertised in that bulletin. And finally, I, I want our, our studies to be funded. I want or the projects to come out of them to be funded, including with our, our new discretionary grant uh, programs. A lot of these things are unique and interesting and do tee up well for different grant opportunities. Okay, if you wanna learn more, I am asking you to Google 
KYTC planning studies. It'll take you to the repository of all the studies that we have. You can also use this awesome QR code with a little dinosaur on it. Uh, yeah, technologically fancy. You just right click in Chrome and it says create QR code from wh whatever page you're on. I learned this yesterday. So please learn more of any, any of our studies, uh, anything that's going on. We've published, I think we published 16 or 18 new studies last year. So there's, there's a lot to look on. There's a lot to keep up on. All right, does anybody have any questions? I have no idea how I did on time. Yeah, about five minutes over, still so pretty good. Great job, Steve. Let's see, I don't see any in the chat box. Anybody in the audience, anybody in the audience? We've had questions you know, before about some of the studies and process, so it's great to hear an update. Uh, Steve, on that. Does everybody know what planning is, uh, corridor study planning specifically, but planning in general? Yes. yes yeah, no. Everybody does. Asleep. Chris says no. Great. Perfect. Hey, Steve. Let's get. Somebody got a question? Steve, this is Bob Kaler from OKI. Hey, Bob. Uh, one more to add to your list to get programmed is that Newport One Way Street. I'm study. working. I, I I was just talking to Dane about it. I'm like, I need to figure out if that ball's actually in my court or not. It probably is. And Christmas kind of made me forget about it, but I do want to start that. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so you see none others. Let's give Steve a round of applause. Good job, Steve. Creative uh, hoop culture there. It's a good job. Okay, so let's see. Um, Mr. Rob Frazier is in the audience today as well. So we'll transition into the freight plan. And uh, he said uh, Patrick Anitor, I think, is going to speak as well with him. Uh, Rob's intro while he gets up here, I'll read that. He's got 30 years of experience in transportation engineering planning degrees from Carnegie Mellon University, California, Berkeley. And he's HDR's transportation planning technical lead for Kentucky, Tennessee, and Arizona or Arkansas. And uh, he also serves as a national leader for HDR on topics such as new technologies, safety, performance-based practical design. And he's a leader of a local STEAM education initiative, helping local students in Louisville achieve their full potential. So with that, uh, see Rob, what should we do here? Hi, Patrick's gonna share the screen. Okay. Thank you, and I'm gonna share only uh, if we need to look at the actual document, so. Okay, yeah, I can see that. Got it up, and uh, and so, yeah, so I, uh, thank you very much for uh, that. Good, uh, that will help. Um, thank you very much for uh, uh, letting us come and, and talk about the uh, the update to the freight plan. This is uh, kind of an update. It wasn't a complete complete new freight plan, but it was an update of what was done previously. Um, Patrick uh, Anitor is going to be um, talking, doing most of the talking here. He was uh, primary author of the document. Um, I actually have the plan up, so we may kind of flip back and forth to show you some of that so you're familiar uh, without going. Uh, well, no one can see it yet because it is under review by FHWA, but uh, um, but I, we can show you pieces just to kind of give you a sense of what's in there. Um, and uh, and so I think, Patrick, I'll turn it over to you to, to go ahead and get started. All right. Thanks, Rob. Um, can everybody hear me? Just a test yeah. check. All right. Um, so as Rob said, uh, this is an update to the 1617 uh, state freight plan. Um, it needed to be updated uh, per FHWA uh, regulations, and it is um, it's developed to support the uh, long range plan um, and comply with the IIJA uh, federal uh, freight plan requirements. Um, we are currently uh, awaiting acceptance from FHWA uh, headquarters. It has gone through uh, the division office and, uh, and is now with HQ. So as far as the outline goes, uh, you know, th this is a pretty text heavy um, presentation and uh, apologize for that in advance. Um, but we wanted to hit everything um, that is required within IIJA so that uh, federal freight funding wouldn't be held up for any reason. Um, there aren't a whole lot of projects, which I'll get to uh, later on in uh, that, that we're asking for within the freight plan itself. But, um, but we wanted to make sure that uh, the KYTC um, is ready to um, 
accept any fundings uh, that might come through. That'll help not only with uh, any any program funding, but as well as uh, any discretionary grant applications that might be submitted um, if uh, um, if KYTC decides to go through uh, go forward with those. So as far as the mission and the vision go, um, they're uh, they're similar to the uh, to the previous plan. Um, obviously, safety is is the key component, um, as well as uh, making sure that whatever improvements uh, come about are within a uh, fiscally responsible way, and to support the economic opportunities um, that uh, that lay in wait for for Kentucky in the future. So um, Kentucky has a lot of uh, multimodal freight infrastructure, um, interstates, parkways, uh, a lot of rail lines, uh, class one, twos, and threes. Um, uh, obviously the Ohio River and other navigable waterways um, provide a lot of economic development um, to, the, uh, to the northern and western borders of, of the state. Um, there are six commercial airports, two of which are, are some of the largest in the entire world, uh, and uh, as well as the pipelines, which uh, which tend to be ignored because nobody sees them, um, but those have to be addressed within the freight plan as well. So in looking at the, at the freight plan itself at a global level, we also had to drill down to um, to what the major components are. Obviously trucks um, beat up the roadways pretty well. And so we wanted to take a look at what the, uh, what the pavements look like so that um, uh, later on, whenever we develop the investment plan, which is required under IIJA, um, we have addressed um, looking at pavements and making sure that trends, um, that, uh, that the pavement conditions trend towards uh, the good rather than the poor, and uh, and past trends have shown that uh, that things are going pretty well uh, in Kentucky. Um, the interstate system um, is is probably due for for some uh, additional investment, uh, but that is coming um, uh, pretty soon. So uh, be prepared to sit in traffic. So. Uh... I'm going to just jump in and say, so you can see this was pulled from the transportation asset management plan. And so we did try to uh, throughout coordinate plans and make sure that that all the statewide documents um, tie together. So. Um, as far as the, the FAST Act and the IIJA go, we also need to look at truck bottlenecks. Um, I, you might have heard about the Brent Spence Bridge. Um, there's that hopefully will be uh, um, will be addressed in the next decade or so, even though um, there's tons of money that is flowing in for that project. Um, but that is going to be um, a boon for for Kentucky um, as well as Ohio. Um, and uh, and the other uh, interstate bottlenecks are obviously um, centered around the uh, major urbanized areas where um, where trucks commingle with other traffic. So. Um, it's not necessarily um, a function of, of trucks backing things up. It's a, it's a matter of uh, trucks being stuck in the traffic that's already there. So while, while you're uh, here, I'm going to just uh, say that I don't see Daniel here, but uh, this was one of Scott Thompson's last... <laughs> things he uh he ran so this is using uh the the uh data that the the great new speed data that we have available to us and identifying where there are uh issues and uh, obviously it uh it identified a major issue that that uh thankfully um yeah we're working towards resolving so so i just thought i'd give a shout out to scott you know he's not here anymore Um, so this is just a graphic representation of those bottlenecks uh, in terms of speed, and it, it kind of highlights what the, um, you know, where they are and the intensity of, of those bottlenecks themselves. This actually helps FHWA um, look at these and say, yep, you guys are right on track. 
and, and the usefulness of this information, I think, to this group and to those who are, are online is if you see something and you have got a project and we've got the data to support um, project development activities. Um, and, uh, you know, if there's, you know, if, if it, you, you can kind of look at this, but we've there's a, all kinds of data to look at how our uh, what are truck speeds doing, not just total traffic flows, but what are truck speeds doing and, and do we care? Um, and yeah, and to that point, Rob, um, truck speeds, I mean, that's that's what that's the measure that you want to look at, not necessarily the number of trucks, but how the velocity of the freight that's moving uh, along the network. Yeah, and you, you can see that there, that that uh, in um, on the upper left, there's uh, Jefferson County there and you can see 265 is highlighted. It, this captures what's actually happening out on the road. So if there's a work zone, it shows up. Um, and so that. You know, if they're in fact um, uh, way stations can show up. I mean, there's things that that so we have to then explain. Um, oh, this this isn't something we're going to change. It's just a, it's just what's happening. So, in looking at the future needs, obviously we're not just focused on trucks. We're focused on the entire freight network because, um, as we've learned over the past few years, um, the supply chain itself is reliant on all different kinds of modes. So, um, so we put these things in buckets um, and uh, obviously safety is, is the number one goal of KYTC. Um, as far as freight goes, um, when you're looking at redundancy, resiliency, uh, technology integration, supply chain, that all deals with economic development and, um, and ensuring that, that the freight gets to where it needs to go and it's used um, you know, by the manufacturers or by the uh, by the consumers, um, uh, so that um, so that economic development keeps occurring and uh, and like I said before, the velocity of that freight um, really um, cuts down on the cost itself, and so then it spawns economic development. So um, so as far as the needs go, um, we looked at these different buckets. Um, so in terms of making sure that we have coordinated the plans, um, the, the different modal plans uh, across KYTC, um, increasing the safety along uh, various uh, networks, including rail grade crossings, um, you know, reducing the, the crashes. Um, and, and what are we gonna do with technology? Um, you know, as far as, uh, uh, you know, new fueling for, for trucks or, um, or, uh, you know, the unmanned aerial vehicle deliveries, um, how are we going to plan for that? Uh, these are all freight needs, um, but they're, but they also flow into, uh, how do they integrate with the, with the passenger network as well? So some of the recommendations that we came up with, um, a lot of them are program level. So this is um, so these are overarching recommendations. Uh, there, are, uh, like I said before, there aren't many project recommendations, which I'll get into here in a little bit. Uh, but primarily, we want to um, we want to focus our efforts on the, uh, and increase the visibility of freight within the state itself. Um, we want to make sure that we. Um, that we implement all the recommendations that are outlined in the truck parking plan, which uh, is uh, is due to be completed here very, very soon. The aviation plan, the, the new Riverport study, and, uh, and I believe there's going to be a, a new update to the state rail plan here coming up in the next year or two. Um, and also, uh, you know, take a look at making sure that as far as this group goes, that freight is in incorporated into the planning processes within the MPOs themselves. Um, it, sometimes it tends to get overlooked, um, but, uh, but it is an important component to uh, the economy of all of the regions within the state. Uh, some of those detailed recommendations include uh, the participation of freight stakeholders in your in your normal processes. Um, you know, again, you, you have public meetings, um, but it, are the freight stakeholders um, represented? 
Um, look at the grade crossing safety in the IIJA. There's uh, there's quite a bit of funding uh, associated with um, with grade crossing safety in their discretionary grant programs. Um, the truck parking and overweight uh, truck enforcement, um, as I had mentioned before, um, the truck parking study for the Commonwealth is uh, is due out here very soon. Um, and to uh, and to implement the recommendations um, of that of that study itself. And when you ever you focus on maintenance and resiliency, um, you know you want to make sure that you have high quality um, pavements and bridges, um, that you have redundancy and resiliency just in case that there's there's bad weather, uh, which we've experienced uh, just in the past year. Um, to mitigate those freight flow disruptions, to make sure that the, like I said, the velocity of, of the freight is moving. Um, and, uh, and, and look at the new technologies. So, and what, is, what are the technologies that are sort of emerging and when will they be adopted? And you, you sort of have to aim, aim towards those. So, what the freight plan does is it sets up the guide rails. So this is this is the bucket that can happen. And if you stay within those guide rails, um, which direction are you going? Uh, when you're looking at uh, at the reliability, um, you know you develop uh, alternate route plans uh, for major incidences. Um, you expand the ITS technology along key corridors to make sure that uh, the trucks know where they need to go and just in case uh, there are incidences. Um, obviously address the freight to bottlenecks, which was um, is sort of a major focus on this freight plan um, and make sure that uh, that the assets themselves um, you know are protected. When you look at uh, the connectivity uh, for communities themselves, um, uh, you look at the, the intermodal connectors. So um, there, there seems to be a gap between like river ports and, and the roadway network, that last mile delivery. Um, the, the, the roads generally weren't made for heavy truck traffic. Um, so uh, so uh, a focus should be on on those major connections in order to move that freight and to integrate the, the different modes uh, to ensure that, um, that the entire freight system is used. Um, uh, obviously air quality is a, is a, big, um, a big driver for this administration, uh, this federal administration. Um, so um, use CMAQ funds um, for freight related um, uh, projects, uh, freight diesel emissions uh, from either whether they're river barges, whether they're trucks, whether they're uh, uh, rail engines, um, provide a, a lot of emissions and CMAQ funds are a good use to, uh, to reduce those. So as far as projects go, I told you that there were only a few. Uh, we got the uh, um, I-69 River Crossing, um, the Mountain Parkway widening and the Brent Spence Bridge. Those are our projects. Um, those, are the, those are the ones that constrain freight the most within the Commonwealth. And so those are the ones that, uh, that the freight plan uh, focuses on. And I think we've made a, a major effort on one of those. So as far as the investment plan goes, like I said, this is required under the IIJA. Um, so we made sure to include those three uh, projects for, for major freight, uh, to reduce the major freight mobility challenges within the entire Commonwealth. Um, and I, I won't go through all this text, but uh, but if you look at the the forecast period, so we we had to do a little bit of work in terms of um, the the years that we're looking at. So the IIJA uh, requires that you look at at an eight year time horizon, whereas um, whereas the 
the previous freight plan looked at five-year time horizon. So we had to sort of extend that time horizon to make sure that our investment plan met that eight-year uh, requirement under the IIJA. Um, and in looking through the, uh, the freight plan itself, these are the new um, IIJ compliance uh, items that are in addition to the FAST Act ones. Um, so so it, what the IIJA did in terms of freight planning for states was to extend the FAST Act uh, requirements, but also add these. Um, so um, in particular, uh, the considerations for military freight, um, the look at e-commerce, um, that eight-year forecast that I talked about, the freight investment plan, um, as well as the strategies and goals to decrease um, the severity of impacts of extreme weather. Um, uh, as I mentioned before, the impacts of freight movement on local air pollution, um, the impacts of flooding and stormwater runoff, and, um, and wildlife habitat which we've heard from other freight plans uh, throughout the country, other state freight plans throughout the country that um, they got kicked back from FHWA because they didn't address the wildlife habitat um, in detail enough for them. So we made sure that, uh, that we did that and hopefully um, we should be hearing it uh, actually anytime soon um, that, this, that this plan has been uh, accepted by FHWA. So Patrick, I'm going to um, just springboard off of that. Um, that I'm going to show that what we did, because that is that is what he's saying is true. So that this is um, some FHWA kind of changed the rules around. He just described some of the rules that they changed, length of time, um, some of the elements you have to have in there. And many states are getting them kicked back. Um, hey, you've got to do this. you got to do that. And so wildlife. Uh, is one of the things. And uh, so I'm just gonna go ahead and share. Um, oh, you gotta stop sharing before I can share, Patrick. It's not, it's not like Teams, I can't just uh, take over. So I'm gonna go ahead and share, share my screen and just pop up here. Um, this is a, a map of where tractor trailers collide with animals. So we, we tried to, I mean, you know, and, and we took credit where we could. Um, there's a there's a tunnel uh, in Jefferson County, and then there's another one, Cumberland Gap. And we kind of took credit where we could, and we just tried to you know we did what we could, um, given these new requirements to make sure that they know we're, we're we're looking at things. I I it is interesting to me. I seventy one gets more than its fair share of trouble uh, in many fronts, and wildlife crossing wildlife strikes is no uh, is no different. And it, I'm sure it's the bifurcation and the great deer habitat that we have in the middle of the highway in a few places. But um, anyway, that is, uh, the, you know, we tried to make this, we tried to get this plan so it, it'll, it won't get kicked back. We can get it, get it approved and, and move on. And, um, and I did want to show, so truck parking popped up a couple of times while uh, Patrick was talking. And there is a complete separate study. Um, but as you, you know, once this document is approved and it's out there and you all have access to it, I mean, part of the point of this document, in my mind, for application and for usefulness is you, you look through it and you see, hey, this, this would be of interest to me. It's got a map of where the truck flows are. Okay, that, that's helpful to me. I'm in District you know, X and these are roads I'm looking at or thinking about and this is what the flows are. And then this is, a, we've got all this detailed truck parking data and we actually gave Jeremy access to the the data so i mean you can get get into the weeds and and we've used that for the truck parking study to identify you know where are their needs across the state and so the stu that study goes into all the details but this just touches on it and um lets you know um you know what's what's available what's out there um you know and then the same thing it's it, you know this this because this is the overarching umbrella of all freight um and so, you know, it's got the, the rail map and all the maps that, you know, we can also get from the web, but it's kind of got them in one place. But it's got a few things that that aren't out there, such as um, that truck parking um, work. 
And uh, so I just want, you know, to me, that's that's where this, um, while FHW requires that we do this to get the funding, I know we have one minute left, um, we, uh, it's got pieces in there that can be useful in a uh, practical way for the planning that we're doing. So um, so I think that's important for everyone to, to kind of know a little bit. It's, it's worth perusing just to, so you know what's in there, so you know what you might want for other projects. Um, as well as for the things that are in there itself and the project prioritization, sorry, the uh, prioritization of uh, of the speeds and all the, that kind of information. So anyway, so I'll just leave you. This is the, uh, it, it was done and submitted in 22. So there's a few things that, uh, you know, we were trying to tie it to all kinds of other documents, but, uh, you know, it, it went in um, back in last year. Yeah, cool. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Rob. Yeah, good job. Good job with the uh, time management there. I tell your season professional. And uh, it's really, yeah, at the beginning, see anybody got any questions? No, I don't see any hands. Anybody got any questions specifically for Rob or Patrick? I don't see anything in the chat box. So, Jay. So Jason Blackburn is asking how is asking how quickly they can be implemented. Yeah. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, the um, so in that particular case, the truck parking study, um, the goal of that is to move the needle to make to 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 document the the real needs there, the real. I mean that that is a that is a real thing, and so we have data that says where that is happening, and um, and so now that we know now that uh, and and uh, so now we can have that conversation um, maybe more effectively because we've documented what some of the costs are to Kentucky of that and what the benefits are if we address it and. And in fact, things are already starting to move. I mean, there's already some truck parking uh, design, you know, design efforts that are being initiated. So, um, so that that effort, that's why that's kind of why I pulled that up is to say that's one of the things that you know, because this this document is is again that umbrella, but but as um, but as you know, pull out specific issues and move forward. So another one would be uh, it's on the same issue of truck parking as T-PIMS and expanding T-PIMS. And that's in that truck parking study is, okay, you know, can we move forward and, and add more facilities into the T-PIMS system and maybe upgrade the technology so we make sure that it is, um, you know, uh, um, as accurate as it can possibly be for the truck drivers so they know exactly what, you know, they, they can trust it. Um, so, and those are just, you know, th those are some of the things that that uh, hopefully we can move forward on. I mean, I think other things are already moving forward and have other. You know, the, the Prince Spence Bridge. We, you know, we tagged it here, and it was conscious. I don't know if it got used in what kind of you know in the application, but it, you know, we was a con. It was it was at the top of the list, and so we made sure to say, hey, this came out at the top of the list. Yeah, good answer. Good answer. Does that help you, Jason? Why and how? How and when and then? Gives you a start. Gives you a start. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Rob. I don't see any other questions. Tanya said it'd be helpful to have a microphone for the questions. So <laughs> I summarized briefly, Jason. So let's give a round of applause for Rob and Patrick. Thank you, sir. Okay, uh, let's see. Up next on the agenda, uh, so yeah, stop sharing there, is Mr. Abdullahi Abdullah. Uh, are you on here? Are you online here? Let me see. Let me check. I am. I'm here. Yeah, sweet. Cool. Okay, so um, let me read your bio here. Transportation Equity Planning Coordinator, Minnesota Office of Transportation System Management. Uh, Abdullahi is a Transportation Equity Planning Coordinator at the Minnesota 
Department of Transportation. He leads the MNDOT's Advancing Transportation Equity Initiative. This is an effort created to study and address the different ways our collective transportation system uh, and associated decision-making processes affect the lives of underserved and, un and overburdened communities in Minnesota. Uh, he's also a local, he's a local elected official and a veteran of the Minnesota Army National Guard. And he has a master's degree in urban planning and a bachelor's degree in construction management from Minnesota State University, Mankato. So uh, yeah, take it away. All right, uh, let me share my screen. Yeah, I can see in here, you just don't see your screen yet. Yep. It's at the uh, bottom there somewhere. It should come up shortly. Do you see that? Oh, no, I'm not sharing it, hold on. Yeah, here it comes. There it is, we see it. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Um, uh, my name is Abdullah Abdullah, as mentioned, uh, and I lead MINDAT's Transportation Equity Initiative. This is a new role for the agency. And also, just before I start, my technology setup is a little bit weird. I'm working from the office today, and, and it's not optimal for um, online presentations. But just let me know if something is off or if you can't hear me very well. But just, just put in the chat or... or uh, speak up because I at this point I don't even see the chat. <laughs> um, so I'll give you just a quick overview of, of the work that we have been doing. Again, uh, before I get to that, uh, the role that I have with MINDAD or Minnesota Department of Transportation is new role to uh, departments of transportation uh, generally uh, for us. Uh, I have been doing this for a little under two years and I'm the first person that, that, that hold the, um, started the position. So the position was just created and it was new. So I'm sort of like forging all these new ways and, and new ways to do uh, business. It's external uh, to the work that we do and we look at the impact of, of our transportation, uh, decision-making uh, processes, planning, projects, all that to communities, specifically communities that have historically um, have not really been involved in the, in the process. So that's what I'm presenting on. Um, if I run on some things, just stop me or put um, questions in the chat. And I think now I can probably see some of the, some of the um, comments or, or the uh, facilitator can just speak and say, hey, slow down. Um, so our transportation equity uh, commitment or work have really meaningfully started in 2017 uh, as part of our long range multimodal transportation plan. We have this plan that we call the statewide multimodal transportation plan that we update every five years, but really is 20 year plan, 20 year vision into the future of, of our transportation system. It includes, um, it's very high level and includes all types of transportation and, and uh, it includes freight, it includes uh, active transportation, it includes uh, highway plans, it includes our freight plans and, and, and aeronautics. That during the 2017 update, five-year update, that is when our communities in, in Minnesota, uh, across the state, were really saying, hey, MnDOT, what are you doing about transportation equity? Because specifically focusing in greater Minnesota, who uh, often uh, felt like they were not included in some of the discussions that are happening in the, uh, in the areas that are more urbanized. And in some of the communities that live in more urbanized areas were also facing challenges about access and uh, transportation or, or having more transportation options um, other than just driving uh, to the places that they need to be. Um, so after those discussions we started, uh, or the agency started what we now call Advancing Transportation Equity Initiative, um, which is a, an umbrella of, of different activities, different projects and programs. They're all um, cre were created to uh, study the impact of transportation. And, and, and if that is just proportionate to some communities and, and who's benefiting from, from our, our, our work, who's not benefiting, who is at the table, who's not at the table, uh, some of the things that we look at is include uh, our existing programs and, and processes and, and really critique and, and, and look at the impact of that. 
We also um, have uh, conducted multiple and, and some completed, some ongoing research projects specifically on transportation. Uh, we're looking at, for example, transport, what transportation looks like in our uh, tribal communities uh, for tribal uh, 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 community members. We're looking at, for example, um, what gender uh, 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 and, and travel behaviors look like uh, in, in Minnesota. We're looking at, for example, performance measures, which, which I will uh, uh, highlight uh, later in the presentation. We also have a, an, under these, this, this initiative, what we call community conversations, which I will also highlight later, which is a, a way to kind of take a step back and go to communities in where they are. I mean, that has seven, eight districts. So we go to each district and conduct about 30 interviews with, with each uh, uh, with organizations in these communities and try to understand what is going on there. So then we can align the needs and the learnings from these communities to, to our planning and programming and project selection and scoping processes. Uh, we're also incorporating transportation equity into our updated plan. So the advanced, the statewide multimodal transportation plan that I just mentioned is one of those examples. This is started with just one page um, uh, transportation commitment uh, uh, and, and, and guidelines in 2017, and now it's multi-page, uh, about a dozen pages or so long, uh, specific strategies and actions that will help us plan transportation equity. And will also guide other uh, plans, like our freight plans, our, our bike and, and pedestrian plans, uh, transit plans, and all those will we'll use this these guidelines uh, to take the first step in addressing transportation inequities. Um, there are also parts of our work, uh, equity work, that look into equitable contracting and engagement, for example, uh, and also like building opportunities and creating opportunities for our communities um, and small business owners uh, by veterans, by uh, women and people of color and other minority groups that have historically not meaningfully included in these, in these uh, uh, wealth creation, creating opportunities. Um, but so I just mentioned all that. When I started, one of the first things that, that in the last, the preceding few years that we learned was that um, depending on who you're talking to, people had different, had different opinions on, on what transportation equity actually means. We didn't have, up until at that time, we didn't have a definition, common definition of transportation equity. So one of the first things that I did was a lead an effort uh, that uh, attempt, we were trying to attempt to define transportation equity with communities, both um, with uh, going through uh, uh, across the state on, on different plat uh, meetings and, and, and established organizations and, and sort of like asking them, hey, they would like to just come and, and to where you are, if, if you could just give us 10, 15 minutes of your time, uh, we have this effort. And we would like to, we're interested in, in understanding what transportation equity means to you, what are important to you, how do you uh, experience transportation uh, in your day to day uh, lives, and, and if you had to define transportation equity, what are some of the keywords that you would use. Uh, we did that. Uh, and connected with over 1,000 people across the state in, in a span of just six months. Uh, this again was happening at the same time that we were doing our, our long range trans transportation plan. So we're also using the same uh, meetings and, and engagement uh, events for that plan to also connect people specifically on transportation equity. Um, we, some of the folks that we connected with included community-based organizations. Again, these are, we call them community-based organizations because they are, they work within a defined geographic area. They know, they intimately are aware of some of the needs that exist, some of the resources, some of the strengths and, and, and uh, that these communities offer, some of the expertise. Uh, so we wanted to build on that and, 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 and have a definition that is grounded in reality um, of, of transportation as, as of today. Uh, but we also connected with our uh, more uh, uh, other stakeholders that, that are the usual uh, transportation stakeholders, but like metropolitan planning organizations across the state. Uh, we connected with our cities um, and municipalities, as well as our federal partners. Also, we looked at internally our uh, employee resource groups, for example, sometimes like we, we have uh, established a and, and, and long list of uh, employee resource groups, uh, such as like that, that, that has um, 
existed in Mindog for over 10 years. So we wanted to connect with them specifically because to, to glean on uh, some of the expertise that they share from their own communities, uh, depending on which employee resource group that, that, that was. Uh, we connected with our disadvantaged business enterprise and workforce collaboratives again, um, and then we came. We took all that to um, uh, a group that we established for the plan for that statewide multimodal transportation plan that we call Equity Work Group. Uh, again, while we were doing collecting all this information, we also wanted to have a structure in place um, and, and a way to to discuss and, and hash things out uh, before we take it to to our leadership. Uh, but one of the, before I get to that, the, what came out of that engagement process, uh, I wanted to kind of share maybe high level, in case you find this useful, some, some of the high level uh, things that we heard from communities across the state, which were just at the time, uh, the definition needs to be strong, and bold, uh, we need to acknowledge historic harms associated with transportation, we need to create uh, also out, like, outcomes that repair and rectify some of the past injustices. Uh, for just quick context, this was happening one year after George Floyd was killed in Minneapolis, by Minneapolis police in, in Minneapolis. So people were very, this was still fresh in their minds. Um, the map that I'm, that I'm showing on the screen, uh, for those that can see, is a uh, shows the locations of highways in, uh, in the twin cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul and, and surrounding areas. And, and the pink ones are, are, are those highways. And what you see those I, uh, uh, the, the outlined uh, areas in, in black or, or dark gray are areas where uh, African-Americans lived in, in, the, in the 50s, 60s and 70s when the highways were built, initially were built. So you see complete, complete overlap uh, of those uh, confined areas at the time. There were also like racial uh, 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 red line, uh, covenants and, and redlining um, and, and, uh, and land use policies that constrict uh, and constrained um, the areas within the Twin Cities that African Americans could have lived. Again, this was not just specific to Minnesota, uh, Minnesota in general, it was a national uh, practice of redlining and, and, and discrimination. But it, it shows the, the level of harm that caused when uh, the folks that lived in these areas, most of them African Americans in uh, middle income uh, and thriving communities, when they lost their homes here, they could, there weren't uh, any, uh, many other places they, 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 that they could move to. So that was uh, uh, one of the things that people were saying when they say, uh, acknowledge the harm that you caused as a department of transportation. This is something that you have done. Uh, community advocates still work on, on some way of, of addressing that. And, and, and we, uh, there's one project that's going on in the Twin Cities area called Reconnect Rondo. Uh, Rondo, again, is one of the neighborhoods that have been destroyed by uh, our in-state highwaymen before. Um, because again, I, I don't have a lot of time today to go through all the details, but I just wanted to kind of like give you some examples of what people were saying uh, in those uh, intentional engagement efforts that we did. Um, this is another example of what this sometimes looks like, right? The one, one of the highways here, there, you see two highways here. Uh, the one on your right is a highway that has been uh, because of the advocacy of, of the people that lived in the area uh, who were a little bit more uh, wealthier and affluent they were able to change the fundamental discourse of the highway from multi-lane six lane highway to just two lanes with the speed limits of 45 miles per hour and no tracks allowed uh, this is the city that you see on the, the skyline that you see in the background is St. Paul. So this is uh, coming from South to into St. Paul and the communities, the affluent fo folks that lived adjacent to this highway did not want the addition, additional pollution as well as the, the noise of, of, of the track. So they were able to hold that process for over 20 years and, and it was just completed in, in, 19, in the 1990s. Um, again, EPA was also happening at the same, like was created right around the same time that these folks were advocating for uh, to stop this highway. But on the other side, on the left side of, uh, of your screen, uh, you see another highway. That's, this is the I-35 uh, uh, or 35W uh, going to, into Minneapolis uh, from, coming from south. It's multi-lane highway, just typical highway, uh, destroyed a thriving black uh, uh, middle-income neighborhood uh, in, the, in the process of it, um, did not really uh, uh, take too long to, to construct the highway. Um, 
so sometimes this is not only, so these are the types of harms that people are talking about when they say rectify those past harms, acknowledge first those, those past harms that you caused. Uh, so what did we do with all that feedback? Uh, we um, came back to, to our, uh, our decision makers internally, our, our organization, our, um, and we had additional discussions about what this means for Mindat. Uh, as, as, as an agency, as a transportation agency, this is what we're hearing, what should we do? Um, so we we wanted to make we decided to define transportation equity based on what people are saying and also like based on our realities and our understanding of our decision makers and our organization's leadership. Um, also acknowledge the historic uh, uh, role of transportation and then also make some strong commitment to transportation equity. I will share some of those. Um, uh, so this is an acknowledgement uh, sentence. Uh, I sent the, the slides uh, to Jacob, so uh, he can share, if you're interested, those can be shared with you. But I'm just gonna spend a few seconds uh, for you to kind of uh, look at those. And then I'll go to the next set, uh, slide. And this is our slide about the, what came out from that process of connecting with over 1,000 people, uh, both internally within the organization, externally with community partners and community uh, uh, based organizations and individuals. Uh, our, how, this is how Mindan is defining transportation equity now, which is transportation equity means the benefits and burdens of transportation systems, services, and spending are fair and just, which historically has not been the case. Transportation equity requires ensuring and reserved communities, especially Black, Indigenous, and people of color, share in the, in the power uh, of decision making. It is uh, just want to point out that it is important not to only focus on benefits or burdens. We have to think about both because sometimes uh, those are not really proportional, or historically that has not been the case at least. And this was something that that was coming up a lot. Uh, so. It, that, that is our definition. Uh, the sentence preceding that Mindan is committed to creating an equitable transportation system just signifies that um, we are committed where we will do uh, what it takes to make sure our system is more equitable, but it will be a long journey to, to get there. And there are, these are all part of our uh, statewide multimodal transportation plan. Uh, there are more details in supporting uh, guidelines uh, with these sentences, but we wanted to make sure everybody is on the same page when it comes to, to what we really mean by transportation equity. It's our, our starting point uh, for uh, all the efforts that, that will follow. I might be just time check. If I have time, I'll share two examples of, of projects that we're doing in transportation equity, but. I also know we have about nine minutes left until your break time. So could- uh, Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Okay. So, so I'll share two examples of, of our work, community conversations and performance measures. Uh, community conversations is uh, one of those uh, efforts that are under our fancy transportation equity initiatives that we started in 20, visioned in 2017, but really started uh, to implement in, 20, in 2019. Uh, the purpose of this is to identify transportation strategies that will really meaningfully reduce disparities uh, across the state. Uh, and we, so what we do is here uh, partner with, with groups and community-based organizations across the state that have already, that are already working in communities. They don't have to be transportation agencies. Um, they could be transit agencies. They could be state government uh, uh, entities like um, not even necessarily in transportation, it could be health uh, uh, department uh, or tribal governments or other local government cities, uh, higher education entities, as well as uh, plenty of number profit and advocacy organizations in each uh, Mindan district. Um, uh, what we try to glean from, and these are, as I said, interviews, we ask about 25 different questions about, about what, is, what is working well, what is not working well, what challenges people are facing, what type of transportation modes that people use, what do they not, which modes do they not use and why? Uh, and what can uh, uh, Mindan do as we look for uh, planning into future projects. These are fundamentally important for us because it gives us uh, more up-to-date uh, uh, um, information uh, from transportation uh, needs in a, in a way that is decentralized. Uh, so far, we have concluded these in um, 
majority of Minnesota, uh, Mindad districts. And we started strategically with the greater Minnesota before we do our metro area um, district. And we are just doing the last greater Minnesota district. Uh, so that means eight districts we have had. And what we do after we conclude all these is just put everything in a in a re full report that details all the, all the learnings from these so that this is available to project managers uh, and they can use it. Uh, not only uh, use some of the information that we learn from this and, and implement, but also reach out to those community partners and, and partner with them again to do to implement the projects that are coming in the future. So that's one, one successful uh, project and program that we are uh, doing right now. Another one that I wanted to highlight is a, a, one of the research projects that we do. This one is one, uh, uh, an effort that a research project that we partnered with Texas Transportation Institute from uh, Texas uh, A&M uh, to look into our and improve our existing performance measures to include equity, what we call equity first principles. Uh, again, the issue that we identified was that we, we had, while we had established uh, the um, measures, they were very general like um, and very high level um, and not very specific. So we wanted to look into, uh, <clears throat> zoom into to focus on the more uh, 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 like law, understand local context what people and, and the type of issues that people are facing. And the type of questions that we were asking are, for example, uh, with these, we wanted to get to the to to answer the questions of who benefits from uh, the success of these measures that we are um, that we we set in place, as well as who didn't get to experience success or experience the burden in order to ensure uh, success. What does that look like? So that's what we're looking in that second item. We're looking at how can the measure be adapted to it so that. Everyone, uh, everyone's needs and everyone's needs are met, and, and also the burdens of that result from if this measure is implemented. How do we make sure that that is fair and equitable? Uh, also, if we adopt these measures, uh, performance measures, uh, what strategic act strategic actions could be taken to address uh, uh, the issue? And Again, this included both identifying about set of existing measures that need to be improved by asking the questions that I, I, I shared, as well as proposing few new uh, uh, English, uh, performance measures that are really uh, specific to transportation equity and tracking the success of, of transportation equity. Um, the, some of the existing ones included transit um, on-time performance uh, that needed to, to be uh, improved further for transportation equity, uh, pedestrian ADA compliance, fatalities and serious injuries, job accessibility, and workforce. Uh, there are also two that are already under development right now, multimodal access and impact and transportation cost. And then the, some of the new ones that have been uh, uh, suggested and, and uh, uh, recommended to, to, to develop uh, include community and built environment factors that impact ADA. Like what does, what does that look like? It's, it, it's not just the infrastructure, but it's also the surrounding area. So what, is that, what does that look like for transportation equity? As well as user experience and local context, uh, zero, emission, uh, zero emission emissions vehicle access and use as well, uh, as well as inclusion and representation. So this is, gets into workforce development and, 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 and those related resources. <clears throat> I uh, will sort of like wrap up with what is next for MINDAT, which is um, now that we have uh, the, the, the basic definitions and, and guidelines, as well as the strategy, the strategy, the strategies and actions to, to advance transportation equity that are outlined in our long range plan, uh, we really want to uh, roll up our sleeves and, and, and get into implement, in, implementation. Uh, specifically, we're thinking about more capacity building uh, uh, around implementation. So that means uh, rolling out transportation equity training. So our key decision makers and, and people that are in, in, in key roles within the organization are our engineers and planners and project and program managers and, and program delivery folks understand what transportation equity is, what, and as well as what they need to do and what that looks like in their own roles. Uh, we're actually rolling out 
the first pilot training next week. It's two day training from uh, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. for two days. That gets into, covers a lot of content. Uh, we're also uh, expanding the team. Right now it's just me that's doing all this work. Uh, we'll hire another person who will plan to help me with that initiative. Uh, so, so more implementation, more capacity building, looking internally, that's what we'll be doing and I'll wrap it there. Um, I don't, I'm sorry, I didn't leave a lot of time for, for question and answers, but I will uh, I'll just wrap there, my emails there if you want to reach out in the future or um, ask any questions now. Thank you very much for having me today. Yeah, thank you. Awesome job. Uh, let's see, is anybody got any questions for uh, Abdullahi? I don't see any hands in the audience. Let's check the old chat. No, nothing in the chat box. Um, you said something about equity in the long range plan. Like, did you get, are you guys done with your long range plan yet or is it still going? Uh, say that again. I was distracted by looking at the text. Yeah. You guys, uh, you said you were doing this equity uh, outreach as part of the long range plan. Mm -hmm. Are you guys done with your long range plan? Are you still working on it? We are. Our governor signed that plan in just two weeks ago. So it's official. Um, and I will share the link uh, with you all. Let me just grab those, those links. Uh, yeah, sure that. And yeah, congratulations on getting that finished. And I like, I like your idea of kind of doing the outreach in some of your other project meetings and things, you know, that's a good idea. <laughs> and it's great to work with you guys. Awesome. Like, uh, thanks for offering to speak. Uh, you know, other states, transportation, and keep us in mind, you know, if you need some help. Excuse me, other speaking engagement stuff like that. You know, we got all kinds of expertise over here too. You know, absolutely. No, thank you for reaching out. Um, and and I was happy to share. I'm always happy to share what we're doing here. I'm also learn from you. Uh, I was listening to that uh, freight uh, presentation, but but uh, thank you for for having me. This this was great. I always just reach out. I will share if I find. Yeah, I will share the, the two links, the, the statewide plan, uh, as well as the advancing just vision equity page, uh, which also has my, my contact information. So I'll share those two resources before I, I head out. But thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Excuse me. Applause. Virtual applause, I guess. <laughs> and uh, yeah, whenever you send that to me, I'll email you the uh, link to our, we just finished our long range plan as well. So I understand what you guys were going through there. Yeah, it's fun. Yeah, it's good to see you and uh, meet you virtually anyway. So uh, with that, guys, let's see. Yes, yeah, sincere thank you to all our speakers for your time, efforts, materials. Thank you to the audience, time, attention, and cyber world. I'll stay on here a few more minutes. I'll give you a few of these updates. We got an MPO meeting uh, one to three after this in C-118. And then uh, HDO, Jason, we do an HDO? Okay, Quasa. So C-117, if uh, they end up having that meeting. And uh, let's see, upcoming STP meetings, April 19th to uh, 2023 in person only. And then July 19th, we'll have another hybrid. Uh, you see some shifting. And then Scott Melton, new KRAD planner, and Taylor Burkett, uh, new grad planner. So welcome, guys. And uh, again, thank you, guys, all the speakers. And I'll stick around here for a few more minutes. If anybody's got any questions, uh, I'll kind of round up the chat box online and that kind of stuff. So... Everybody have a good day, safe travels, and everybody knows your way out if you don't uh, email me or call me. All right, see you.